It doesn't matter how sincere you are in your prayers. You can cry yourself through your prayer. You can pray for hours. You can be passionate in your prayer. But if your prayer does not conform to his plan and purpose, it's all fizz and bubble. Psalm 145, and we'll start at verse 5. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts. And I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. I've called this message, There is a Struggle That Comes With Prayer, Part 2. So last Sunday we started this subject, and obviously, as Elijah said earlier, uh, feel free to go online just to uh, get part one. So let us briefly remind ourselves of a few of the highlights of what we talked about last week in our introductory comments to this important subject of prayer. Let's remind ourselves. And I've got eight different things that I want to just share with you real briefly. Number one, prayer is communion with God. Number two, prayer is two-way. It is actual direct interaction with him. Number three, prayer does not come naturally to the natural man. Number four, if you want God to draw close to you, you need to draw close to him. Five, prayer is aligning yourself with the heart of God. Six, prayer should be based primarily on thanks, praise and worship Not give me, give me, give me. Amen? Seven. The essence of prayer is not to change God's will, but to accomplish it. Number eight. God ordaining the end of a situation as sovereign Lord does not negate him using various means to accomplish that. Prayer is one of these things. Would you agree? God uses prayer to fulfill his will. So hopefully that's not too much. I haven't overloaded you too much right at the start, but that's just a recap of some of the key points um, that we covered. We covered a lot of stuff last week, but I want to dig a little bit deeper and just, just to learn a little bit more. And please know this this morning, that me as a preacher, when I get into a subject like this, rather than feel that, that I have nailed it, kind of just shows me how little that I know on the subject of prayer. And everyone that I know who's a believer and who is real and genuine will admit that they're still learning on this subject. How about you? Anybody here nailed the subject of prayer? Okay, so join the club this morning. We're all on a journey. We're all learning. We're all growing. We're all maturing and developing on this subject. I want to say this, that prayer is found throughout the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, you will see this, uh, this subject of prayer coming up. And it is a powerful spiritual force and something that God wants his people to do. God wants you to pray. 18th century Christian writer William Laws says this, Prayer is the nearest approach to God and the highest enjoyment of Him that we are capable of in this life. 
this is a big thing. We emphasized last week the importance of knowing the will of God and then introducing that into our prayers to God. Um, and this is not small because will of God prayers are the only prayers that he hears. Are you hearing me? Will of God prayers are the only prayers that he hears. All the rest just bounce off the ceiling. But to do that, we learned last week, that we need to know the revealed will of God in Scripture and also be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So if you want to please God in your prayers, you're going to need to know this book. You need to, Because in this book contains so much information that we can actually introduce into our prayers. If we are ignorant of His will, then our prayers are going to be selfish and sinful and are going to miss the mark. I don't know whether any of you have ever done archery. But um, in archery, if you're a bit like me, you always want to do as well as you can in any sport. What's the key in archery? Hit the bullseye. And I'm telling you, when it comes to prayer, I want to hit the bullseye with God. I don't want to waste time just vomiting out words that are just me. Selfish, pointless, worthless words coming from the heart of Paul. I want my prayers to come from the heart of God. James 4.3 says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. If you imagine that God is going to circumvent His will, do something that contradicts His promises, or perform something that is contrary to His word, then you are exposing your own ignorance. God will not go against His revealed will. Um, it doesn't matter how sincere you are in your prayers. Um, you can cry yourself through your prayer. You can pray for hours. Um, you can be passionate in your prayer. Um, but if your prayer does not conform to his plan and purpose, it's all fizz and bubble. It's a presumption. It's a delusion. It's not just crucial to know what the will of God is. You need to then pray the will of God. Now, here's the good news. If you don't know the will of God, it's okay to ask him to reveal the will of God in your prayer. Okay, so please don't say, well, I can't open my mouth unless I know the will of God. Well, you can actually come to him and say, Lord, I don't know. I need you to reveal yourself. So he speaks through his word. He speaks through his spirit. And as you start to interact with him, he then starts to give you the words to actually pray. I don't know about you, but I've come into prayer meetings at times and I'm dry. There just doesn't seem to be anything in the well to come out. And sometimes you just pray the simplest of prayers. Help, Lord. Give me the words. Or, I don't know, Lord. What do you want me to say? I'm just saying those prayers are in the will of God. So if you know the will of God, you pray out the will of God. If you don't know the will of God, you have to ask him to help you to know the will of God. And sometimes then, as you ask and you start to open your mouth by faith, things start to flow out of you that, that, that weren't there five minutes ago. Does that make sense? So, it's not an, there's actually more, okay? So stick with me, okay? It's not enough to know the will of God, okay? Now, please hear what I'm about to say. It's not enough to actually know the will of God. You then need to employ that revelation in your communication with God. So a lot of the time we may be aware, we have the knowledge of what the will of God is, but we don't employ it. And especially in regard to the situation that we're going through. We may know what God has done back in the day in this book. But that doesn't mean we're going to employ it. Would you agree? So you have to, you can't divorce yourself, your prayer from the revealed will of God. Your prayer, you have to bring them together so that they merge or mesh together. or They're married together. Then as you pray, there's a potency because your prayers carry authority. 
It's not you, but you're saying, God, I know who you are. I know what you do. I know your character. And I'm asking for help. Please remember, it's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you and then energize. So God reveals and then he energizes you. He inspires you. He gives you the ability to flow in what he's shown to you. Now last week we quoted Romans 8.26. Uh, but I didn't read Romans 8.27. And it reinforces what we were actually talking about last week. Uh, Romans 8, 26, I'll read the both verses together. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The next verse says, And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints According to the will of God. Amen. According to the will of God. Do you see that? So the Spirit of God reveals the will of God if we are sensitive to the Spirit. Sometimes that literally means coming into His presence and instead of coming into His presence and just immediately speaking, sometimes it means coming into His presence and just settling yourself. Just settling yourself down until you feel that peace. Because I feel feel in my own experience it's only when I feel that peace that I am actually in a place to be sensitive the alternative is there's a hundred things going about in your head and you know that you have to do this this and this and suddenly what you find is you just start to starts to just become you circumstances life that comes out instead of just chillaxing Lord I, I, I need to hear you I need to feel your, your enablement here because I just don't want to just vomit out me. And I'm sure you can all identify with this, that a lot of time, if we're not careful, it can just become a religious ritual of what we say. You find yourself saying the same thing over and over again, and it's like, <sighs> God's probably bored hearing the same thing. Do you understand? And I'm talking about, there's one thing when the Spirit's working through you, it's fresh. Fresh oil, amen? amen. Fresh bread, fresh oil. Anybody ever at steel bread? What's it, how, what's it like? Huh? Okay, well sometimes what happens is, because we've been praying the same prayer for 103 years, we come with them and we're coming to God with steel bread and steel oil. And it's like, we don't even need to open our eyes because God knows exactly what we're going to say. Do you understand? But I'm telling you, when you're in his presence, it's fresh. It's alive. It's vibrant. Are you with me? Yeah. So, you, because you just read something this morning. And that something this morning has grabbed a hold of you. And it has just become alive to you. So your prayer has become alive because your prayer is quickened. It's the same with the Holy Ghost. He gives fresh oil. Yesterday's oil, yesterday's manna is not good enough for today. So I urge you to let the fresh bread of the word and the fresh oil of the Holy Ghost have an impact on your prayers. So that means instead of just speaking, you're just, you settle yourself. You just settle yourself, compose yourself for a moment, and then you go as he goes. Okay. If you go whenever he's not going, guess what? It's going to be just you. Now here is an important revelation to have. The truth of this here leaves us totally and utterly dependent upon him. This is a very sober truth to take a hold of, but it's a very necessary one if we do not want to waste our whole Christian life talking into the air or missing the mark. By the way, I'm trying to simplify this subject. I hope this morning this is not complicating prayer to you. You say, well, I've got a shop in this, and I've been keeping to that, and I'm going to stay there. Well, you can. You can if you want. But I'm telling you what, there should be a freshness to your prayers. 
Now you could be praying about the same thing for 30 years, but there could be a freshness to your prayer every day. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? I'm not saying because you prayed about something yesterday, you shouldn't be praying about it today. But I'm saying that it should be enveloped, enveloped with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, which makes it alive, it makes it active, it makes it vibrant. Be sensitive to the Spirit operating inside you who will work in you to pray according to the will of God. That's what it says. According to the will of God. Now, I also came across another passage which we read this morning. And I read it in my devotions over this last seven days. And we were saying... um, Last week about learning um, to draw nigh to him, and then he'll draw nigh to us. Okay. Well, our reading this morning in Psalm one hundred and five, eighteen. Listen to what it says: The Lord is nigh, or close, or near, unto all them that call upon him. To all that call upon him, in truth. Okay. So. Um, what is this saying? Truth matters to God. When you come to Him, your prayer should be in spirit and in truth. Your praise, your worship should be in spirit and in truth. So just don't think that you can come in and you can wing it or everybody out there who prays their little prayer before they go to bed, that God hears that. He doesn't. God hears certain type of prayers. So, if you want to get close to him, it better be on the grounds of truth. His truth. Not your perception of truth, but his truth. Not your twist on truth, but his truth. Please do not think that you can come on your own terms. Now, I want to be as much practical and spiritual help to you this morning as I can in regard to prayer. Um, And as I say, I don't think that I've nailed this subject, but... One thing I've learned over the years is it is impossible to divorce the Word of God from the Spirit of God. These work in tandem to enlighten our understanding and then energize our spirits to effective action. One thing you should know is if you are neglective of God's Word, you are ignorant of God's will. I'll say that again. If you are neglectful of God's Word, you are ignorant of God's will. I I have never seen somebody who refuses to read the word of God who can pray Holy Ghost quickened prayers. But if you're in the word, there's something fresh that's going to come into your prayer. Because that book affects your spirit. And that book gives you knowledge. And as you pray then, it all starts to come out. Pastor Terry Fittis used to say this, what's down in the well will come up in the bucket. What's down in the well will come up in the bucket. Okay? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you're full of religious ideas, worldliness, selfishness, then that is what will come out in your prayer life. If you're full of the knowledge of God, then the Spirit will ignite that truth and that will come out in your prayers. Now, I've said all that to say this. I'm not saying that that means you have to quote Scripture verbatim, word for word, for your prayers to be effective. What I'm saying is that truth becomes alive to you. And you start to, you may paraphrase that truth, but you're actually speaking his truth. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not in any way saying don't memorize the word of God because it is good to memorize the word of God and it's good to pray the word of God. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying if you read something this morning and you didn't memorize it, you can still pray that truth because that pr- truth is quickened to you, it's alive to you, and even though you're putting it into your own words, it's still his truth. Does that make sense? Because I just don't want us to be on a legalistic bondage. Well, unless I quote the word, the word of God, word for word, he's not going to hear. No. 
I'm talking about the quickening of the Spirit. I'm talking about the, the depth of the Word of God. By the way, that's if you want your prayers to have an impact. I remember talking a few years ago to a guy who was drunk. I shouldn't even have went in. He invited me around to the house. I didn't know he was drunk. And oh, he ends up, I sat there and he, he starts going on and a whole load of religious nonsense. And I'm like, and he says, oh, I pray every night. He says, every time I come home from the bar drunk, I, I pray that, 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 that you know, God's going to look after me. And if I die during the night, then I'm going to go to heaven. I think I said something to him. Um, I says, well, that's not the way it works. I says, God's not a genie in a bottle. I says, he's not some religious um, superstitious like icon that, that you pray to. I says, if you're not right with God, he doesn't hear your prayers. Well, cut a long story short, he threw me out of the house. He threw me out. And he, he was playing something in the background, um, like religious move. He got the... The atmosphere right for me coming, I think it was Johnny Cash or Elvis or some singing gospel songs in the background. So he thought that that, that would probably work with me, but it didn't, okay? <laughs> Simply because, do you know what? I owed it to that man to tell him the truth. See, most people have this like superstitious God. Oh, if I don't pray before I go to bed, I'll have bad luck. Or... I get up in the morning. I always pray before I go to work, even though they're the biggest heathen in town. This, this, this is like their religion. That's not the religion of the Bible. Talking to God is because you know Him, you love Him, and you're interacting with Him. He's speaking to you, you're speaking to Him. It's communion. And I'm just saying it's okay sometimes to help people say that's not what prayer really is. Would you agree people don't like to be cut across? Okay? But you know what? Even though that, that man's gone today, any time that I spoke to him, I always told him the truth. And guess what? But every four weeks, I would always get a phone call from him. And it's funny. One of the things he says, well, I know when I talk to you, you tell me the truth. Amen? Yeah. So sometimes we think if we tell people the truth, then they're going to want to go the other way. No, they know whether you're telling them the truth or not. So they want to know the truth. Some of them are so weak, they just can't walk in that truth. And unless God quickens them, there's no hope. As you glean God's heart on an issue, and you embrace that truth, you then need to share that truth. Now, that's the same in evangelism as it is in prayer. Okay? So, obviously, God reveals something to you, you embrace it, you get it. So it's not enough to get God's truth. You have to then put feet to that. Sometimes in prayer, sometimes in evangelism, sometimes in just holy living. But it's not enough to receive. So as you receive, it starts to become who you are. And then it starts to flow out of you, especially in things like prayer and evangelism. But if you want to do business with the Lord, listen to His voice, believe His voice, obey His voice, Ignore every other voice that contradicts his voice and then share his voice. Share it. Share it. The will of God involves a cost. God's plan and man's plan normally go in opposite directions. Would you agree? God's timing and man's timing are normally in opposite directions. If you were perfectly honest, there's probably something big on your heart this morning. There's probably been something big that you've been praying for a long time. But I would safely say that your timing and his timing are probably off. Would you agree? I mean, if it was you, that thing would have been sorted out right away. huh? But if God hasn't answered that prayer, why not? It's not his time. And that's where you start as you learn this book. You learn that he is a lot smarter than you are. That his viewpoint is a lot better than your viewpoint. So the God that you have is not a God who you order about. Do this and do this right now. But he's a God who you come to humbly and say, Lord, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, we're the clay. 
I'm bringing this petition before you. You've instructed me to ask, and I will receive. To seek, and I will find. Knock, and the door shall be open unto you. So the interesting thing is, when it says ask, it says ask. It's in, it's in the continuous. Ask, and keep asking. Seek, and keep seeking. Knock, and keep knocking. There, there was something when about, there was... There was a confusion that went about about 20 or 30 years ago. That it went, it spread about America in some circles that if you ask more than once, it's unbelief. <laughs> that went about. And, and a lot of people were saying, ask more than once. And I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> you, whenever it talks about it, it, it's pray without ceasing. The, you know. Well, the, the example that had come to mind, the first one was that Jesus prayed twice for a man who was blind. So if he was out of the will of God, then, then he was a sinner. Do you understand? And, and Jesus prayed continually for his disciples. He prayed continually for certain things. I'm just saying it's a lack of faith to just pray once and give up. Are you with me? So what I'm saying is be careful what you receive on prayer. Make sure it aligns with the book. If you know this book, then you know what they're saying is nonsense. And you can say, no. No. There are certain elementary basics that we need to be aware of if we're going to be effective. For example, we need to be, we need to be aware of who we are. If you want to be effective in prayer, you need to know who you are. Who are you? You come before a holy God. Who are you in the light of Him? But we're unworthy. Would you agree? We're unable to know a lot of things. So we come before Him humbly. So I would urge you that know who you are. Know that He's God and you're man. Okay, that's a real smart place when it comes to prayer. So that, that helps you not tell God what to do. Yeah. Okay, it helps you to ask. And it helps you to ask and not put a whole load of conditions. Like, Lord, I want you to do this, and would you do it then? And I want you to do that, 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 and that, as if we need to tell him. Do you understand? It's like, just trust him. But, and this is where I want to get to this morning. This is where I'm really trying to get to here is, we need to be aware of who God is. And I want to just dig there for a few moments, so just stick, me, stick with me. You know, that may sound like 101 Christianity, but we might be shocked how many Christians approach God with a faulty attitude. Just they're, they're, they're messed up here in regard to who God is. So, Rather than ask God to do, many tell him what to do. Some of a small God and a big devil, many limit him with their words and their attitude. Some have an angry, judgmental God who carries a baseball bat waiting for the first opportunity to wallop them. Can you imagine what effect that would have on their prayer life? Think about it. Some delude themselves into thinking that God is cool with sin and that they can still ask and he will stand attention every time that they speak up. No. If you're going to live in open, rebellious sin, guess what? I can guarantee you on the authority of God's word on multiple passages that he does not hear your prayers. Honestly, you might as well talk to that wall. Because God is not hearing your prayers because guess what? You're not hearing his prayers. He's telling you to repent and turn from your sin. And you're going, no. No. So you come to him saying, Lord, I need you to do this. And he's going, no. He's going no back. Is that not fair? If you won't listen to him, is it fair for him not to listen to you? Well, that's what happens. So you say, oh, I can have my sin and have God. Nonsense. Nonsense. 
Some have a distant God who never seems close. He doesn't seem caring and he doesn't seem interested. Can you imagine how that would affect your prayer life? He's always away, way far away. He's a distant God. There's many that don't believe him. Many just selfishly use him when their back is against the wall. Others legalistically fear him and have no genuine intimacy with him. Can you imagine coming into the presence of God to pray thinking that he doesn't like you? Believer, think about this. If you're his child, he likes you and he loves you. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that lovely? Amen. But if you're coming in with a perception, he doesn't like me because I feel them last night. I feel them three days ago. He doesn't care. He doesn't like me. I'm talking about his children here. He does. So whenever you come in, whenever you come into his presence, you better know who he is. You better know his heart toward you. Okay? Um, others, and I want you to hear me, others ritualistically or religiously or superstitiously approach him without actually knowing him and they're talking as a stranger to a stranger. That's terrible. Think about it, coming into his presence and talking to him, but you're a stranger and he's a stranger to you. That to me is hell on earth. How about you? I can't think of anything worse than being a stranger to God. The creator, the one who's going to one day judge all mankind and say, well done or away from me. And yet he's a stranger to me. I'm glad that God is a friend to his children. If you're a child of God in here, you are the friend of God. Who's your best friend? Okay. We can say, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything, everything, everything to him in prayer. See, when he's your friend, it changes the whole playing field. It changes your prayer life because you know that you're welcome in his presence. But all these things are barriers to getting the ear of God. Would you agree? They're barriers because we're not approaching him in spirit, in accord with who he is. We're not approaching him in truth. Truth is according to this book. So your revelation of God should match up with the revelation of God in this book. If it doesn't, then you need to ask yourself whether you have the God of this book. Let me say that once more. Your revelation of God should match up with the revelation of God in this book. If it doesn't, then you need to ask yourself whether you have the God of this book. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Or is that being unfair? I think that there must be a general awareness of his character, his ability, and his instruction in order for you to be effective. So, here's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and I hope that you never get sick of me quoting it, but I'm, even if you did, I'm still going to keep quoting it. Okay. <laughs> Hebrews 11:6. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That to me, I don't, probably there's, there isn't a passage since I started to preach maybe 30 years ago. There's not a passage I've quoted more. Because every time I read it, it's like, there's the key. We need to know who he is. Can I ask you, I want to ask a question to this whole congregation this morning. Who is God to you this morning? Who is God to you personally? Who and what is he to you? Do you have a proper perspective of his character? 
How big is he? How powerful is he? How faithful is he? How able is he? It all depends to whether you know him or not, how close you get to him. John Piper said this, May we remember that believing that God is who he says he is and will do what he promised to do and then acting according is what is pleasing to God. So, I'll say that again. May we remember that believing that God is who he says he is and will do what he promises to do and then acting accordingly is what is pleasing to God. Basically, when you take him at his word. Lord, I believe. I believe. It may look impossible this morning. It may look dark. It may be depressing. It may be grievous. It may be lonely. But I believe. I believe. Accurate knowledge on who God is and what he teaches is crucial to effective prayer. But unless we actually let that revelation of who he is and what he teaches take a hold of us and then influence us, then it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It is simply intellectual, religious knowledge. So, I want you to come particularly close now. When you recognize that the supernatural God of this Bible is your God, and how he deals with his children in this book today is how he deals with his children today, then this will have a mega effect upon your prayer life. Your trust in him should be rock solid. Your faith in what he promises should be unwavering. So, when your back is against the wall, when things look bleak, we should take great comfort from Joseph in the pit, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, Israel at the Red Sea, the disciples in the storm, Paul and Silas at midnight in the prison, etc., etc., etc. Why? Because he's your God. If you can read these stories and it's just like foreign to you and that was back then and I just don't relate to that, you're not getting it. You're honestly not being driven by the God's truth. So your perception of his character is your own perception. Not according to truth, but according to your imagination. But also his promises are questionable because you're divorcing yourself from his promises and maybe doubting his promises. Say, well, I know it says, but. Whereas the opposite of that is, I believe. That's why I've said to you, I, back when I was a young believer, I used to, I was scared of losing my salvation. Then God dealt with me with that passage in Hebrews that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And this is what the Holy Ghost asked me. Do you believe me or do you doubt me? And that changed my whole life. It's like, Lord, you said it. I believe it. You said that you're never going to leave me and you're never going to forsake me. I believe it. That changed me because I wasn't building my theology on man or this church or this creed. I was building my, my confidence in truth. So I could come into his presence knowing that the one I'm coming into his presence, that he's never going to turn his back on me. Do you think that affected my prayer life? Does that affect your prayer life, knowing that? That he's on my side, he loves me, he cares for me. Does that not affect your prayer life, knowing that I can come in and just, he's my father. I'm his child. I am welcome in his presence. I can tell you what, you're like me. If there's people out there, you're very careful what you tell them. Would you agree? Or do you just vomit up your guts to everybody out there? There's a lot of people out there, I wouldn't share anything personal, intimate, or I wouldn't leave myself vulnerable with them. Why not? You know what they'll do? They'll take your head off. 
dog eat dog. And, oh, you can tell me. And before you know it, it's round Facebook, it's blah, blah, poof, it's going throughout the world. Huh? But I'm telling you, when I come into his presence, I can trust him with anything. I can share my innermost weaknesses, my failures, my fears, my doubts, my anxiety. I can pour it all out to him and I know that it's safe. Yeah. <coughs> How do you know that? Because I know him. I know him through a revelation in this book, but I know him personally. So your experience should line up with this book. If your experience doesn't line up with this book, then you're either backslidden or you're not saved. E.M. Bounds, who a lot of evangelicals with classes and authority on prayer, says this. Trust perfected is prayer perfected. Trust looks to receive the thing asked for and gets it. Trust is not a belief that God can bless or that he will bless, but that he does bless here and now. Trust always operates in the present tense. Hope looks forward toward the future. Trust looks to the present. Hope expects. Trust possesses. Trust receives what prayer acquires. So what prayer needs at all times is abiding and abundant trust. Trust in Him. Armed with a proper knowledge of God, listen to what David prayed in Psalm 7, verse 1. O Lord my God, in Thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. When you trust Him, you know He's going to watch your back for you. Amen? Amen? So he starts off acknowledging, Lord, I trust you. Then he brings his, his trial before, before the Lord. He says, Lord, I'm dealing with this. Will you help me? Will you deliver me? Okay? But he starts by acknowledging your character, Lord. You're trustworthy. What I'm saying to you is when you come into his presence to pray, do you, do you acknowledge his character and say, this is who you are, Lord. I know you're this. God. So therefore, because I know that you're this, I bring this petition before you in confidence, by faith. Mm -hmm. By the way, next week, God willing, I do want to touch the subject of faith. But I feel like God wants us to consider his character today. Because if this is wrong, our prayers are wrong. Would you agree? I mean... Honestly, if we don't grasp this, then we just end up just getting into a religious rut. And then we, we just, like, our prayers just don't seem to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Nan Jones, who's a pastor's wife, says this. God wants us to understand who he is and in that understanding to be still and trust him. God wants us to understand who he is and in that understanding to be still. And trust Him. Mm -hmm. So, what grabbed me about our main reading this morning was this. The revelation that the psalmist had on the character of God. This is what it said. Our reading started in Psalm 145 verse 5. I will speak of the glorious honor of Thy majesty. His majesty. And of Thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good. Amen? Amen. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. David was qualified to talk to God because he knew God. He knew his character. 
But if you look at the prayers of David and you look at the prayers of the psalmist, I think this was the psalmist, not David, this one, but um, as you read the prayers, you can see these guys knew exactly who God was. When they talked to God, they weren't talking to some stranger and they, they weren't trying to twist his arm or manipulate him. They were just lifting him up and saying, thank you, Lord, for who you are. And because this is who you are, would you do this? Does that help you this morning? Is this mighty, victorious, majestic, all-powerful, faithful God the one that you're praying to this morning? Is this the God you know? Or is he what we talked about earlier, this, this God who's just far away, he's impersonal, he, maybe he answers your prayers, maybe he doesn't. Maybe the problem is actually your concept of him that is stopping you receiving from him. You know, Paul the Apostle said this, for I know whom I have believed. Paul knew who he was talking to. I know whom I have believed. And if your religion doesn't involve a personal relationship with God, then what is it? It's just, it's all sham. I know whom I believed. You know, if you have to ask other people, to tell you whether you're saved or not, you're probably not saved. I mean, it's like me going and asking Les or Ron this morning, am I married? They're like, hello, um, here's a clue. Um, there's a few people who are actually at your wedding that I know, like Pastor Tim or whatever. Um, do you understand? Like, how absurd is that for me to have to go, Christine, am I married or not? But do you understand, how absurd is that? So how absurd is it for me to go to Jesse? Jesse, am I saved? Do you know, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able. He is able. He is able. Charles Spurgeon said this, In the same way the sun never grows weary of shining, nor a stream flowing, it is God's nature to keep his promises. Therefore, Go immediately to his throne and say, do as you promised. Do as you promised, Lord. Do as you promised. Isn't that lovely? You're going to do your will, Lord. Do as you promised. And by the way, even if it's difficult for you, you're going to still say, do as you promised. Your view of God is either right or else it's wrong. If it's right then there's no limit to what you can both do together in prayer as well. If your understanding of God is wrong, then there's no depths to which you will sink. Honestly, there's nothing worse than sitting beside somebody who doesn't know God and they're trying to talk to God. It's terrible. It's like, it's terrible. There's no revelation no quickening of the spirit it's just dead it's dry it's dead have you ever been to a dead church have you ever been to a dead church for a funeral the church is more dead than the corpse at the front <laughs> i'm serious it's like this is terrible and they can't actually spontaneously or extemporaneously pray they have to read their prayers because they don't know the one they're talking to Huh? It's terrible. Well, why do they write down all their prayers? Because they don't know him. They don't know him. That's why somebody wrote that prayer like 300 years ago and they're just reading that prayer every Sunday, the same old, same old, because they don't know him. And if they don't know him, they're a child of the devil, even if they have a dog collar on. <laughs> And a Batman suit. It means nothing to God. Most of them didn't go to seminaries. They went to cemeteries. <laughs> Rene Swoop says this. We learn to trust God's heart by interacting with him and experiencing his character 
in personal ways. So as I come to a close, um, the longer you know him, the more you get to know him, your prayer life should develop and mature. You should find yourself just going to depths in prayer that you didn't go five years ago, ten years ago. Because the world says love like starts here and then you just start to lose, whatever. But it's the opposite in the spiritual realm. Your love should be growing toward the Lord. You're, you, you should, whenever you talk to him, you're not talking to a stranger anymore. You're talking to a friend. So I urge you, I urge you when it comes to this subject is, the key is get close to him. Get close to him in truth. That's what the passage said, in truth. Which means in accord with this book. Let us pray. Charles Stanley said this, I have complete confidence that God is able to take care of any situation and provide an answer to any question or problem. He has all the resources of the universe to draw upon in helping each one of us through any type of crisis if we will trust him. The question today has to be, are you trusting him? Are you truly trusting him? If your revelation of him is correct, then you will trust him. How can you not? How can you not trust the God who parted the Red Sea, who opened the eyes of the blind, that reached out to the unlovable people of this world? How could you not trust him? He hasn't turned his back on you yet, even though you deserved it. How many times did you deserve him to say, that's it, I'm done. But he refused to do that. I'm telling you, if you know who he really is, then I'm telling you, your prayers should be potent. That we would leave this place just more enlightened, but more stirred up and challenged that 2023 will be different. It's not going to be the same old, same old. It's going to be different. That... There's just going to be more quality time with God. That's where it starts. If you're not having quality time with him, everything else is going to just go by the wayside. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for our apathy, our unbelief, our, our lack of taking you at your word. Lord, our neglect of the place of prayer. Lord, I feel when we get under this subject, Lord, that we all have to drop our heads, Lord. Because we don't talk to you enough. We don't thank you enough. We don't praise you enough. We don't worship you enough. And Lord, as we just remind ourselves of who you are, Lord, we should never need forced, Lord, to come into your presence, to give you your due. You are worthy this morning. You're worthy of every thanks that we can present before you today. I just pray that this church would just go to a new level in prayer. That this house would be known as a house of prayer. That each of us would just be determined that our flesh would not call the shots. But Lord, that your spirit and your word would call the shots. So Lord, this we pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.